I want to read, to begin our time, I want to read verse 2. And then verse 20. That's how we'll begin. So 1 Samuel 24, verse 2 says, Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. And then verse 20 says, and this is Saul speaking to David, he says, and I know, in, and now I know indeed that you shall be, surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that as there's so many voices to listen to today, and we need to hear your voice more than we hear any other. We need to believe what you say more than we believe anything else because you are the truth. And Lord, you're, you're the only one that has a solution to the issues of the world and to the issues of our own lives. And so, Lord, we look to you. We need to trust in you. We pray that, Lord, if among all the other things that you would seek to accomplish in us, and we know that you want to accomplish things in us. For us, this is all just a test. That, Lord, one thing that would happen is that the grip of the world on our hearts would be loosened if there's any left. The grip that our hearts have on the world would be destroyed, and we would hope in you alone, that we would rest our hope fully on you and so lord we pray for revival we pray for awakening we pray for peace because there's no way that we can see it coming apart from you but we know that you're able to bring it so speak to us through your word help us to believe it and apply it to our lives help us to see you and we pray it in jesus name amen please be seated i'm going to read through as we've been doing, we'll read through, make a few comments on the, along the way, and then we'll come back and uh, make some application. So 1 Samuel 24, 1. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following, following Philistines that it was told him, take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And we know from uh, the previous chapters, you know, it's, it's said earlier, Saul's been hunting David daily. And... Uh, he kind of caught up to him in the previous chapter, got close to catching him, but then uh, providentially God uh, drew Saul away by causing the, uh, the Philistines to invade the land. And, uh, and so that gave David some relief. And so David found a new place to go hide out. He went to En Gedi. There's caves there. Uh, it's a place where the shepherds would... Um, take their flocks. The caves were big enough for uh, a big, a large amounts of sheep, so big enough for David and his uh, group of guys to, to go hide out in. But of course, uh, word gets back to Saul that that's where um, David is. And so once the, once the uh, threat of the Philistines kind of lets up for a moment, Saul goes right back to uh, his priority. And his priority, of course, was hunting David. And it says in verse 2, Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So da Saul's so intent that he gathers, it says chosen men. That means he looks for the best guys. You know, he looks for the best warriors. This is, a, for him, it's a, like the most important mission. And so he gathers these guys to go hunt David. Remember, David only has about 600 guys. So you got a five to one ratio of, you know, being hunted at this point. And it says in verse three, so he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there, was, where there was a cave. And Saul went in to attend to his needs. Now, in the original language, the, that's a euphemism for, I mean, how do we put it? Number two, he went into the cave to go drop a load. That's what he went in there for. And you do that alone. It doesn't matter how, I mean, nobody does, I mean, women go into the bathroom together, but I don't know what happens in there, but for whatever reason, women go in together. But guys go alone, you do this alone, this is a private deal. 
And so even though he's the king, he, he goes into the cave all by himself. And, um, and it says David and his men were staying in the recesses of the, of the cave. So if you've ever been in a cave and you are in there and you're trying to hide, you can, if you're in the back in the dark, but the light's up front, you can see out pretty good because of the light. But the person can't see in to the dark. So they're back there. Not only do they see Saul, but they can see what he's doing and all that kind of stuff, but Saul can't see them. And so they're, they're kind of hiding out. And uh, it says, verse 4, Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. So everybody sees what's going on. Oh, man, there he is. This is it. And we don't know when the Lord said this specifically to David, uh, you know, this is, that he's going to deliver your enemy into your hand. But they, everyone there sees it as this is it. God said he was going to deliver him. Look at he's he's uh, serving him up for you right here. And, and so David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now, it doesn't say... If Saul's still wearing his robe, probably not. He probably took it off to take care of his business, but he surely kept it close to him. And so, you know, David's right there within reach. His men are encouraging him to take Saul out, but he doesn't do that. He just goes up and takes off a corner of his robe. Verse 5 says, Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him, because he had cut off Saul's robe. He had a prick of his conscience even doing that. He, his guys wanted him to kill him. He didn't do that. He just took some of his clothes, part of his robe. But even that bothered him. And, and he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. Saul's still the king. David still recognizes his position. And he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to kill him. He says, my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. And, and so that's David's concern. He's like, I mean, he's the king and he's the king of Israel. And Israel is God's people. And God's the one that put him on the throne. And, it, and David's like, it's not for me to remove him. And so David restrained his servants with these words. So he wasn't, he didn't only restrain himself, he restrained himself, but he, by saying this, he says he also restrained his servants and did not allow them to rise against Saul. Because probably what you would imagine is David's like, I can't do it. And I would imagine the other guys were like, well, we'll do it for you. But he wouldn't let them do it either. And, and so Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Verse 8, David arose, also arose afterward, went out of the cave and called out to Saul saying, my Lord, the king. So David didn't want to let the opportunity pass. He, he felt like I can accomplish more than just sparing him here. And so he goes out and follows Saul. And um, again, the positioning would be such that, you know, he's still separated from his 3000 men. And David's close enough to be able to say something to him. And it says, and when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And so just humbly speaking to him. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you. But my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. So he just, saw, David wants to let Saul know, I could have had you. I had you. And why are you so threatened by me? Why are you listening to whoever you're listening to about all this? You, this should be everything you need to know that I'm not a threat to you. And so, moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for 
in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. Again, he's just making it abundantly clear. I am not a threat to you. And, and uh, I mean, if there was going to be any problem, it would be over already uh, with me. And he's also, why are, you, why are you treating me like this? Let the Lord judge between you and me and let the Lord avenge me on you. In other words, David's pointing out, you're the one that's actually doing all this. You're the one that's been, tr- you know, you're the one that's kind of the problem here. But he says it real politely. And he goes, and yet even, and by saying this, he's saying even, even though that's the case, I'm still, I'm still not going to do anything about it. I'm going to let God handle this. Uh, but my, and he says, the Lord shall avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, and this is probably just some saying of the time, wickedness, because we don't know where else it comes from, it says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked. You know that saying, king. But my hand shall not be against you. In other words, if I was wicked, you'd have been done. But I'm not. And, and after whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A flea? Therefore, let the Lord judge be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. I, again, I'm no threat to you. I'm no more dangerous to you than a dead dog. I'm no more threat to you than a single flea. I'm nothing. And so it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, is that your voice, my son, David? Remember, he's his son-in-law, so he's, is that, you know, are you, is that my, your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Then he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. So Saul totally recognizes that everything David's saying is true. He, man, he really could have taken me out. I was, I mean, you know, and so, and you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. Again, you know, he even recognized the whole thing. He sees it for what it was. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? In other words, I've been treating you like an enemy, but you just, you didn't treat me like an enemy. Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And and now I know indeed that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Therefore, swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. And so, at at least at this moment, Saul's uh, convinced, man, this guy is better than me. He really, God is really going to make him king. And, And in that time and even today, you take out your political opponents. That's what, that's just what you do. That's what human beings do. It's a horrible thing. That's why one of the reasons why there's so much, so many uh, bloody, you know, uh, changes of power throughout history. It's constant because you take out your opponents. Once you take power, you take out your opponents, anyone that might be an opponent. And, and so he tell, Saul tells David, when you're king, be merciful to my descendants and my family. And so David swore to Saul. He said, yeah, I will. And Saul went home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. And so this chapter uh, takes quite a turn from the beginning part of it to the end. That's why I read verse 2 and then verse 20 to begin with. Because at verse 2... 3,000 men on the hunt for Saul. In verse 20, Saul's like, man, you really are going to be the king. And, the, and it's just this major turning. At, at, at the beginning, Saul's hunting David still. At, by the end, he's declaring, you're going to be the king. And he asks him to swear that you'll be kind to my descendants. The subject of our study and the, the focus of our applications are on what happened in between? What made it go from we're gonna, I'm going to kill you and take you out to I'm going to leave you alone for, for now? 
And what it is is we see a, a beautiful picture of a man of God loving his enemy. That's what it is. It's a, just a picture of this. Uh, Matthew f- uh, 5, Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, uh, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. The world doesn't do this, but here's how the kingdom of God works. And if you're in you're a child of God and you're my kingdom. Here's how I want you to treat your enemies. It's so different. It's so opposite. It's so contrary to what the expectations of the world would be. Uh, I read this from C.S. Lewis. Um, it says, real forgiveness means looking steadily at the sin. Don't ignore the sin. Don't act like there's no sin there. But, but the, looking steadily at the sin, the sin that is left over without any excuse after all allowances have been made, and seen it in all its horror, dirt, malice, and meanness, and nevertheless being wholly reconciled to the one who did it. And that's what David is trying to do here. That's what he's seeking to do and live out. And our passage shows how a child of God is supposed to act toward an enemy. And and so David, this is what's going on. He's hunted, he's cornered, he's hiding out. He's in this cave, and then all of a sudden, there's opportunity to to turn everything around and end this, you know, being hunted by his enemy. And and uh, and he could have so easily. Saul would have never known what hit him, you know. And and he could have done it. And these guys all could have went home, and it just you know would have been over. But, but the chapter illustrates how a godly person can show love for an enemy. When Jesus says to us, love your enemies, it's meant to be practical. It's meant to be something that we actually do. He, did, he didn't mean you should feel warm and fuzzy about people who are against you, you know, and, and love that way. That's not what love is. He meant we're to treat even those people who are the absolute, who are absolutely the most against us, with good, with blessing. And the, and the reason why we're supposed to do that is because we're part of a different kingdom than the kingdom of this world. And the kingdom of heaven is like that. And we're, we're here to show the world what the kingdom is, of heaven is like so that they'll go, wow, that's way better. That works way better than the way the world's been doing it. And so we live in a time right now of extreme division. I mean, there, I read an article this morning. I don't, is there anything left that unites America at all, really? I mean, pretty much everything, you name it, is, it's been anything that would have united us before, it's been destroyed. And, and not only that, but the, the way that opposing sides view each other is very hostile, as we can all see. And, 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 and this division makes it so that you people so often see the other side not as just, oh, they're dumb. It's not just like that anymore because that's bad enough to go, oh, they're stupid for thinking that way. But now it's this enmity, this, this enemy kind of view of things. And yet, as Christians, we're still supposed to love all people. And, and we're, we're not here to make enemies we're not here to, you know, maintain the war even. And, and so uh, just as David didn't look at Saul as his enemy, Saul was the one who did that. The reason why this enmity went on was 100% Saul. David did not contribute to it. But just as Saul, uh, David didn't look at Saul as his enemy, there, there are and there will be Many who make themselves our enemies simply because of our, our walk with the Lord, our relationship with Jesus, our, our view of the world and how things ought to be because we believe God's word, people will look at us as enemies. And David shows us how to love our enemies. So we're going to look at seven things 
that show how to love our enemies, to love those that are actually against us. And the first one is that we're to maintain a sensitivity to the Spirit of God. When David, when David was there and had this opportunity, man, he had Saul in the bag. It was not, it was, Saul was completely vulnerable. When are you more vulnerable when, than when you're going, you know, when you're taking a dump and your pants are down your ankles? You're, I mean, there's no more vulnerable position than that. Especially if you don't know someone that wants to take you out is right there. I mean, you're no more vulnerable than that position right there. And then he has what everybody else would see as legitimate cause. His men are urging him to do it. And David even crept up, totally undetected. But then he only cut off his robe. He didn't do it. It could, again, these guys were going through it for a, a while now, hunted, without cause. And, 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 being, and, and they, they could have went home. They could have been done with being fugitives, but he wouldn't do it. And we're told what stopped him. It doesn't say right away, but it says what stopped him. We, we link it to it because it says even after he cut off his robe, it says his heart troubled him. Even though he didn't touch Saul, even just cutting a piece off of his clothes. In David's mind, that was still a hostile action. It was still too much. It was still something he shouldn't have done in his heart. And he felt bad about it. Why? Why did he feel bad about that? Why would he be bothered what, for doing far less than what everybody else thought he should have done? And it's because David's heart was for God. And because of that, he was in tune with God and the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is merciful and gracious and kind and loving. And David's own walk with God he enjoyed the grace and mercy of God. If you walk with God, you will enjoy his grace and his mercy. And that relationship caused him to, to be sensitive to that, to be in tune with that, even in the face of such ter terribly unjust treatment. We don't have it in ourselves as sinners to just love people that hate us. It's not in us. As sinners the worse people treat us the more we want to either run and have nothing to do with them at best or at worst get back at them but that's not what God is like that's not how God treats his enemies and if we really know him we're gonna know that because the very first enemy that he treated good was us the Bible says because of our sin we're at enmity with God and 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 the longer we hang out with the Lord, the more that that will become part of the way we act and think. We need to hang out with the Lord to, to have that established in us, though. It doesn't happen automatically. Remember uh, James and John, they wanted to call fire down from heaven to a town that didn't want to receive Jesus. And Jesus said, man, you don't know what heart spirit you are, are of. I didn't come to destroy people. I came to save them. And, and Jesus didn't make any qualifications when he said that. He didn't say, I came to save good people. He didn't say, I came to save people who are nice to me. And, you know, he said this regarding people who were completely against him or at least indifferent to him. And, and that's the heart of God toward those who are against him. While we were sinners, Jesus died for us. And so David's stain, the stain of David's hand here was done because of his sensitivity to God. And that's how it will come to us. We're not going to just conjure it up. We're not just going to go, I'm going to be, I'm just going to love them. It, it, we, it's not in us. It's in him. But it flows to us as we walk in our relationship with him. The, the next uh, thing is, in order to love our enemies, is we need to make a firm decision that we're going to do that. We need to make a firm, firm stance that I'm not going to be somebody who attacks or retaliates or is even involved with that. And, and in, in as much as loving our enemies happens through our relationship with God, that we need to have this connection to the Holy Spirit, it still doesn't just happen automatically. It's not like you're, 
you know, just going to automatically love your enemy. The Spirit doesn't, the Holy Spirit doesn't force us to do anything. He prompts us and convicts us or convinces us, but we still have our own choices to make <clears throat> and decisions. And, and that's what David did. He made a conscious decision not to attack Saul. Again, in verse 7, it says, he said, the Lord forbid that I should do this. The NASB says, far be it from me. In other words, no way, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. And, and, and again, it's not, what, it's not that David probably wasn't very tempted to. I'm sure he was. It would have been easy to make the case. And Saul had it coming to him. He, he could have, David could have easily said, he drove me to it, you know. Saul drove me to it. Uh, what else could I do? And, and, and David and even Saul both saw this, you know, this whole opportunity as the providence of God. Uh, you know, the, they both said the Lord, you know, his men and Saul himself said that, that God delivered him into your, your hand. But David said, no, I'm, I am not doing that. And, and, and the strong decision and stance to be merciful to his enemy also was spoken to his own men. In other words, we are not doing that. I'm not doing it. You guys aren't doing it. And, it, and the reason why that was important is because I'm sure there, there, you know, you can imagine that there was some element of, okay, David, I could, okay, I get it. He's your father-in-law. That would seem strange and that would be crazy. It's hard for somebody to do that, but we'll do it for you, you know, kind of thing. And, and David was like, no, we're not, we are not doing that. I'm not, we're not. And if we're going to love our enemies the way Jesus commands us to, we have to be purposeful about that and make a decision, a conscious decision about it. And verbalize it if necessary. I'm not going to attack you. And remember Jesus said, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And Jesus didn't just say it, he actually did it when he was on the cross. Remember, he, he himself prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And so decisions to do right and good are needed. Doing good and right has to be decided. You know, it, okay, you can know this is the right thing to do and this is what God says, but you have to decide that's what you're going to do. I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to be like this. I don't even want to be involved with that. And so David, David was very decisive here. He didn't do it himself. He didn't pull a technicality. Well, I'm not going to do it, but hey, I can't control you guys. None of us are doing this. And then the next thing is, in order to love our enemies, um, we want to approach and interact with our enemies with humility. We need to show humility. Um, the, the Bible says that as much as is possible with you, be at peace with all men. And, and that means the idea there is that um, as much as possible, you, you make the effort, you take the steps, you do what is necessary. And as we're to be at peace with everyone and love our enemies, when, when we enter into hostilities or enmity with something, it almost always starts with the way that the, the conversation, it's usually started in terms of how communication happens between different parties. And then it can develop into more, you know, if it's not restrained at some point. And so if we're going to act peacefully, we have to start by speaking peacefully. And, and David gives us another simple example of this. Uh, even though Saul had treated David like total trash, like just bad, the, the, the worst. And they hadn't actually interacted in a while. We don't know exactly how long it's been, but it's been a while. They hadn't even seen each other or talked at all. Da and David was hunted and you know, lost, he had to leave and all this kind of stuff. When David had his first chance to speak to Saul, and who knows how long, he spoke with humility. Look at Verse 8, he says, my Lord, the king, he even bowed before him. He called him his father. Remember, he's his, still his father-in-law. There's a lot of different ways he could have, you know, uh, addressed him at this point. And 
There's a lot of different things he could have said to him. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up anger. If you're married and you've never tested the truth of that proverb, I cringe for how difficult it's probably been. Give that a try. Proverbs 15.1. But, but this is something like, this is what David was doing here. Not only does a soft word turn away wrath, so do soft actions and humble actions. And again, why did David do this? I mean, he's, it's almost like he's acting like he's guilty here. Why, why, he didn't do anything wrong. He was the one being mistreated. He was the one being harassed, treated like a criminal when he didn't do anything. He hadn't done any wrong towards Saul. So why, why should he have to do that? He shouldn't have to. But it's wise to know what works. It's wise to walk in the ways of God. And David loved God, and because he loved God, he loved people, and he loved peace. If, if at the first opportunity to face your enemy, this is my chance. I've been waiting to say something. I've been waiting to get in this guy's face. If your first opportunity is just, I, I'm just going to lash out at them, I promise you it's not going to go well. It's not going to work. It's not going to solve anything. It's not going to settle anything. Yeah, I mean, you ever think about gang violence, right? It just escalates. Why? Because you did this to me, I'm going to do that to you. Okay, well, you did that to me, I'm going to do that to you. And it's just con constant escalation. It never, it never, you, the, the, the ongoing counterattack doesn't de-escalate every, unless everybody's dead. And, and this, this back and forthness. Retaliation only creates escalation in the war. It, it's, it's seldom that someone being confronted harshly is going to go, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. I'll just back down. Even if they're wrong, that usually doesn't happen. I mean, I'll speak for myself. I've been wrong and had somebody lash out at me. And you know what? Because I'm a sinner, I still get defensive, even if I'm wrong. I'm sure some of you are the same. But a soft answer does turn away wrath. It's kind of like the, the relational equivalent of dropping your weapon. You know, it's, it's the relational equivalent of, you know, I'm going to douse this fire. And, and doing it in such a way that the enemy actually sees you doing it. It goes a long way. Love your enemy by approaching them with humility. Uh, next, to love our enemy is, uh, in order to love our enemy, we can be opposed to their sin, but don't define them by their sin. Don't think that's all they are. Look at verse 9 again. David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm? And we don't know exactly why David says this. We don't know if there were actually people saying this, or David just thought, Somebody must be saying something to him, like he's just trying to figure it all out. We don't know exactly uh, if he was assuming or somebody was really doing it. But what David says here is still a good tact to take. It's still a good idea. It's, it's kind of like saying, Saul, come on, man, you're better than this. You're better than it. Or it's a way of pointing out the error or the sin without accusing. There's a subtlety here. But it's a good one. The subtle difference in the way that David says it. He could have said, he could have said the same truth without as much, uh, but made it more, way more personal and, and attacky. And why are you so twisted to treat me like this? I'm not out to get you. Why are you treating me like I'm? You know, he could. What's wrong with you, man? He could have done all that. And it would have been factually true. 
to say it that way. Because Saul really was twisted in his thinking and his actions towards David in, in this whole thing. But again, David knew, wisely knew this wouldn't help. And not only that, but okay, so Saul's doing this, but that's not the totality of Saul and his, uh, that was the problem. But what Saul was doing and what he was thinking, that's what it was. And so he, David took the worst of it without saying, this is what you are. Does that make sense? He's, He's wise enough to confront the problem without attacking the person. When we're loving our enemies, it's not like we're surrendering our convictions. It, it, when we're facing people that are opposed to us, but we don't have to attack them. It's kind of a fine line, but there's a way to focus our attention on the sin without a, attention uh, without the sinner. When you know somebody who's sick and diseased, they have a sickness and a disease. They are not the sickness and the disease, right? We understand that. When somebody is out to get us, they have a problem, but they're not 100% a problem. And it's helpful to think of people that way. They aren't the enemy, but they're in the grip of enmity. And and if we can look at them that way, it's easier to look at them like they need to be freed instead of they need to be overcome. See how the difference I need to if I see them as they have this problem that they're that it has them in their grip as opposed to they are a problem. If I think they are a problem, then I got to overcome them. I got to I got to personally conquer them. But if I can see them the other way then it's it's we're able to move in a more gracious way. If I only look at them as their sin, it's harder to love them because we're not we don't if we're walking with the Lord, we don't love sin, we hate sin. So if I only see them as the sin, then it's really hard to love them. But if we see them as in the grip of it, you know, like the person who has the disease. I hate cancer. I hate cancer, right? We hate cancer. Who doesn't hate cancer? Why? Because it's got them in their grip. So the rioters, the looters, political opposition, racism, racist people that are acting in racism, all these things, If we're going to love them, we got to see them in the grip of this evil as opposed to them being the evil. Love them that way. There's a bonus point here, actually. What David said to Saul is really good advice both for both Saul and David. Don't listen to anyone saying this junk, right? Don't listen to anyone who's saying to you that I'm your enemy, that I'm going to be a problem to you. David himself would also need to take that in because his own men with what could be argued legitimate reason could say the same, this guy Saul, man. But man, what a what an important thing. I don't know how else to do this, but to limit how much time you spend online. <laughs> how much you're reading the news or watching the news or on social media. They're so toxic. I don't know how they became this way, but they are this way. That it's just constant anger. I don't know how to love your enemy if you're on these things so much. I don't think it's possible. If you know that it's possible, you're better than me, and I don't even want to hear how it's possible because I can't do it. We have to limit how much we hear about those people, those people, those people. 
It's impossible to love them if that's all we think of them. And, and David told that to Saul. David needed to hear it himself. And, and we need to hear it ourselves too. And not just online, but any conversation that we have. It makes it very difficult to love our enemies if the only way we look at them is... And the next thing in the way to uh, love our enemies, and it really goes along a lot of these overlap, is to see our enemy through the eyes of God. One of the most awesome things that David did here in loving Saul was he saw Saul in light of God's best view of Saul. In both verses 6 and 10, he referred to Saul as the Lord's anointed. And the reason why he did that is because he was the Lord's anointed. He was anointed. Now, does that, does, does that, was that anointing still meant to keep him forever as the king? Of course not. We already know that. It doesn't matter that that anointing, in a sense, was revoked because of Saul's rebellion. He had been the Lord's anointed. This respect, this recognition of this is how God looked and saw this at this man to David was always going to be there. It's kind of like how you look, uh, or we used to in this country when we used to respect position, and we don't very much anymore, but you still call a guy who was president, you know, 30 years ago, Mr. President. If I run into an old coach, I still call him coach. I still do to this day. If I haven't seen him in years, I'll call him coach. And, and David could have said a lot of other things about Saul that were true. He could have said the crazy king, the rejected king, the godless, rebellious guy, the nut job hunting me down, my crazy father-in-law, insane guy throwing spears at me. What's wrong with this guy? But he chose not to think of him that way or label him that way. I'm not going to label him that way. You're, you're somebody that God pulled and said, I want this guy to be the king. And so he called him the anointed of the Lord. And, and yeah, sure, David was anointed to be the next king. But you know what David was not anointed to do? Take out his predecessor. That, wasn't, that had nothing to do with his calling. That was God was going to do, deal with that. And so David saw, saw, still saw Saul in light of God's grace on him. And so again, he's like, I could have killed you, but I'm not, I, I'm not, I wouldn't do that because you're the anointed of the Lord. You belong to him. He put his blessing on your life. He wanted that good for you. He put you in this authority. It doesn't mean that Saul could, you know, get away with and do anything that he wanted. God would, but David was like, God will deal with that. His role David saw him in light of what God thought of him, and he saw him in light of what his role was and what his role wasn't. And, it, and David's role was not to, to take out justice on this guy who was his enemy. I'm going to say something extremely obvious, if, and if it's not obvious to you, we need to talk. I hope most people understand and realize that it's not appropriate to correct another man's wife, right? Yeah, I, we all know this? Hope so. It's not appropriate to correct another man's wife. Even if she does something offensive, you know, you would go talk to the husband. Hey, man, I just want to let you know, you know, your wife, what she said to me. And so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> but it's never your job to go correct someone else's wife. Because that relationship utterly supersedes any interaction, even that happens between you. And, and the Bible says this about our relationship with people, too. In Romans 14, 4, it says, Who are you to judge another man's servant? To, to his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will make him to stand, for God's able to make him stand. And, and David under, had that kind of principle clear in his mind. Saul, Saul was many things, but more than anything, and the highest thing that he was is somebody that God would deal with and answer and, and be uh, involved in. 
And, and people can be many, many things to us. They can be an enemy. They can be offensive. They can be a jerk. They can be reckless, clueless. They can be mean. They can be ignorant, et cetera, et cetera. But more than all that, you know what every person you've ever met is? Somebody God loves. Every single person we've ever met is somebody that Jesus died for. Every single one, no matter how nasty they are. And, and he, he died for the violent offender. And so even if there is an offense, God will deal with it. And that should be plenty to not only restrain us from attacking our enemies, but it ought to be plenty to help us to love our enemies. That the same Jesus who died for me, in all his grace, died for that person that hates me. He went to the cross for them. Just as Jesus died for my sins, he died for the sins of the person who hates me. He came to save them while they were still a sinner, while they're still a sinner. sinner. And so we can do that. We're able to do that. And David didn't just do that. He spoke lovingly to the enemy. David is showing us that an opportunity can, to an enemy can either be an opportunity to retaliate or show mercy. Every time we interact with an enemy, somebody who's against us, it's an opportunity to retaliate, act like them, or to show mercy. And David's like, I'm going to use it for mercy. I'm going to... if we. It's hard, especially if there's an active hostility towards you. But what an opportunity to go, man, you know what? God loves you. God loves you. And then the last thing is speak to your enemy. And again, a lot of these are kind of overlapping, a little bit redundant. But speak to your enemy in the most peaceful, non-attacking way you possibly can. David coming out to Saul. Again, he didn't need to do that. He, he survived the, you know, Saul came at him. He didn't know David was in the cave. David's just trying to survive. David could have just went, man, that was close. He, he was so close. If he had known we were in here, we would have been trapped. We survived it. But, but David had a purpose in going out to speak to Saul And it was so that he could not only treat Saul with those gracious, merciful, loving actions, but speak them to him. To let him know. To let him know, I want you to know. And I want everyone else here around here to know, I'm not a threat to you. Not in any way whatsoever. Look at what just happened here. Not only would I not attack, I'm telling you I won't attack. I was in a position to do you great harm. And you know what? Even if you're guilty, I won't attack. I'll let God deal with that. I'm going to leave all that to the Lord. I'm going to leave him to avenge it. I am not a threat to you. A dead dead dog is no threat, and neither am I. A flea is no threat, and neither am I. And and, and even as it relates to you hurting me, I'm not going to try to stop you. I will leave even that to God. Again, impossible to do this apart from the help of God in our hearts. Only someone who really trusts God and believes Him could make that kind of a commitment to be that gracious. But that's what Jesus says His kingdom is about, and that's how He wants us to act. And He's worthy of that, of us acting that way. So it's not just that we don't attack our enemy, but we could, when we have the opportunity, assure them in some way. They insult you, bless them. And and even if you feel like, well, I've been doing that. I've already done that. I've been doing that a long time. I haven't done anything to them. Well, keep doing it. That's the way Jesus is with us. He doesn't want to give us what we deserve. He wants to give us peace. And 
And when we receive his peace, then we got all kinds of peace to give to other people because it's, it overflows in us. We can throw aside every vestige of trying to put up a fight. This is pure and simple grace. That's what grace is all about. And look how powerfully it, it, it worked. Remember, he, at the beginning of the chapter, he's got 3,000 men ready to kill David. By the end of the chapter, he's like, man, I know you're actually going to be the king. I'm so sure of it. I want you to promise me right now that you won't take out my descendants. The Bible says it's God's goodness that leads us to repentance. And one of the ways, one of the great ways God wants to show goodness is through his people to those that don't know it yet. Now, sadly, Saul's change of heart here was temporary. He, he'll, he'll come after Saul, uh, David again. But at least it doused the moment. And, and, uh, and it was because David loved his enemy. He loved him with powerful mercy, huge grace, and promise. I promise this is how I'm going to be with you. And our very last point is that everything about this is comes from grace. Loving your enemies comes from grace. And, and, and again, it all started with us being enemies with God and Him doing exactly this to us. Again, we were in rebellion to God. We, he is Lord and God. He is in charge of everything. And we're, we're like these individual usurpers who like want to take and go, no, you're not going to be God. You're not going to reign over me. And we might not have ever verbalized it that way. That's exactly how we live. And every rebel to a powerful king really deserves to be taken out. And yet the king of the universe said, you know what? I love you. I'm not going to attack you. I actually want to save you. I don't want to send you to hell where I could. I love you. And he can even look at the individual ways we've offended him. All the individual sins that we knew, yeah, this is sin. I, God doesn't like this, but I'm doing it. And he looks at it, and, and every single instance of it, he could just go, man, you're guilty of that. You're out. But he, but he just, he doesn't do that. He blesses those who curse him. God does that. And when we understand that, man, what peace the fight, the war is over. At least it's between me and God. While the nations continue to rage around us, we can, be at, we can have peace and then offer it to people. And really, that's the only way we're going to have that. How gracious he is. He doesn't want to fight with us. Crazy that would, we would want to fight with him. We're not going to win. But the same, we, we can offer this to this lost world. And we pray that we'll be able to, that he would help us to do that. We're going to have communion now. So, got your little package. Again, there's a little thin layer on the top. If you can peel that first, you'll expose only the wafer. And I'll call it a wafer because if that's real bread, it's a shock to me. <laughs> so if you got that out, then what's left is there's a, a, a bendable tab, and that'll be the juice. But we, we do the bread first. So if you're at home, hopefully you have your elements with you. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat this. This is my body broken for you. And what he was showing is, this is what I'm going to do on the cross. This is how I'm ending the war. I'm taking what you deserve. And he says, I want you to eat that. I want you to take that in. So go ahead and eat your, uh, eat the bread. And then after he took the cup,
And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. I'm, he said, I'm keeping this covenant, promising it, guaranteeing it by pouring out my blood. You don't have to earn it. I'm paying for it. Again, he's ending the hostilities. He's saying, here's how I make peace with you. And so we drink. And he said, as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim his death. This is my peace. This is our peace. We have peace with God. We have peace to offer the world. Jesus Christ. And if you're listening right now or sometime later in the future, you're on Kept FM, you're watching online, God wants to have peace with you. It doesn't matter what you've done, how you've offended him. He offers peace. He says, I will forgive all your sins. My son died. He took the penalty you deserve. And if you believe him, if you trust him, commit to him being Lord of your life, he'll come into your life and you'll begin a brand new life. When you die someday, maybe you'll get the coronavirus and die. I hope none of you do, but you could. Maybe you'll be somewhere and there'll be a riot and something bad will happen. I hope not. Gosh, I hope not. But this world's not a safe place. But no matter what happens, you live till you're 99 or 105 or we don't know what happens tomorrow. Jesus promises us eternal life if we trust him. That we can be right with God. He's made peace for us. He looked at us, his enemy, and said, I love you. And so may we walk in that. Let's pray and then we'll finish up with one last song. Father, we thank you. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to be like you. Every single one of us shining the light of your love and your mercy and your grace to a very angry and hostile, lost, confused world. Lord, we pray that as we love each other and those that hate us, that it would just set people free, it would be powerful, and that we would be able to point them to you. We pray for your help and mercy on our entire nation, not just our individual lives, but our entire nation. But we know, Lord, you change a nation by individuals. So, Lord, please give revival. Please, please give awakening. Please, Lord, give us peace. Help us to love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.